Can the world be transformed simply by giving free books to everybody, everywhere? One man's on a mission to find out, and you're about to meet him. From the edges of publishing, it's Disruptor, celebrating the rebels, mavericks, and weirdos of the publishing industry, and encouraging each of you to disrupt in your own way. Now here's your host, John Bard. Greetings one and all, and welcome to Disruptor, Episode 2, Todd Bowl of Little Free Library. My name's John Bard. I've been in the publishing world for close to 30 years, and I've seen a lot of things change, but maybe they haven't changed fast enough. And so I asked the question, are there disruptors out there? Are there people and companies that are really changing things in publishing, pushing us into the future, throwing out the old rule book and creating a new one all their own? I went in search of that, and I found them. And every week here on Disruptor, you'll meet them. Welcome to the journey. It's time to disrupt. Today's episode of Disruptor is brought to you by Writing Blueprints, the breakthrough step-by-step system for writers that creates truly great books. To learn more about the most disruptive way ever to become a successful author, visit writingblueprints.com and use the code DISRUPT to save 10% off everything on the site. The writing world has been shaken. Meet the earthquake. Go to writingblueprints.com and use the code DISRUPT to save 10%. Writing Blueprints. This is how you write a book. Truly disruptive ideas don't have to be complex. They don't have to be futuristic. Sometimes a simple notion can lead to a giant disruption. Take the case of Todd Bowl. In 2009, Todd built his mother, a teacher and lifelong reader, A gift, a small replica one-room schoolhouse with a glass door on front and filled with books. They put it in their front yard. Soon people came by to borrow books and put books in. Neighbors asked if Todd could build them their own little schoolhouse library. He did, and it caught the attention of a local professor named Rick Brooks. Together, Bull and Brooks looked at how they could take this simple idea and turn it into something truly special. Inspired by Andrew Carnegie, who in the early part of the 20th century set a goal to fund the creation of 2,500 free libraries, Bowl and Brooks created their own goal, to have more than 2,500 little free libraries. Today, there are more than 75,000 little free libraries around the world. This disruptive idea that started with a simple gift is truly transforming the world. Let's meet Todd Bowl. Well, it is my pleasure to be joined by Todd Bull. He is the founder of Little Free Library and a true disruptor in the most lovely sense of the word. And welcome to Disruptor, Todd. Thank you very much. I'm uh, glad to be here. And uh, it's an exciting interview topic. Thank you. Let us begin with a question I like to ask all my guests. We here at Disruptor celebrate the rebels, the mavericks, and the weirdos of the book world. Which one of those three words best describes you? You know, as soon as you said that, I think it depends who, who, who you're asking. You know, I, I think you can get all of those from different people that know me. I, I often, I never think of myself as a disruptor. And then I get often uh, accused that I am. You know, I, I guess sometimes I'm uh, a bit of a, a rebel because I, I don't follow the lines necessarily or what you should be done. I guess my uh, uh, record, I guess, as a kid when I was in school was that I would be uh, told that I was contraire and that I was brash. And, and I never thought I was any of those things. I only thought that I wanted to understand. And uh, uh, just the other day I was, te- I was talking to a group of 4-H kids between 9 and about 15, and there's one little kid in the front that just kept asking question after question after question, and it was irritating. And I thought to myself, that must have been me, you know, (laughs) perpetually curious. Tell everybody in 30 seconds or so what Little Free Library is. Well, Little Free Library is a book exchange that goes out in front of people's houses, parks all around the world. There's, uh, as of 
August 1st, we'll have 75,000 little free libraries around the world, all across the United States and Canada mainly, but also in over 85 countries. And uh, Little Free Library has this great accelerated ripple effect where you put one in, uh, you put 10 in, there's going to be 1,000. You know, so it, it, we've gave away 20 of them in Detroit and in, in Cleveland, and now there's 350 and 400 of them. So it's a, it's a great ripple effect that I think is the better side of humanity, the better side of us that comes out when you have one in your front yard. And it is really a positive disruption because it is doing something that empowers people and that brings us together at a time when there's not a lot of things that bring us together. So I find it just a, a, a wonderfully apt disruption for this moment in history. It's a sweet kiss of community. It's just, you know, it's a sweet side of us coming out. It's, uh, if you've ever worked in a disaster like a flood or a hurricane and you work in these uh, situations that, the community is coming together to help the community. They don't care who you are, where you're from, what you're doing. You're saving the community. And that's why, uh, and that way, I think Little Free Library is like a flood without a flood. You know, people come together. It doesn't matter who they are. They want to fix the community and make it better, make it a better place, and make sure that, um, you know, literacy is better in their community. Um, I just got through done reading Madeleine Albright's book on fascism. And uh, she talked about how, 25% of the world across the board is okay with a dictator, you know, and then in her book, she also said at the end, I'm not sure that people know how to tell what is true. And if you consider that 25% of the populace think, thinks a dictator is okay, and then you have that element with people not knowing how to tell what is true, we're really in trouble. Right. And so I think, the literally, literally, the survival of democracy is based on people's ability to read, to read well, and to critically think, and to understand what is true or not. And, and I think we really have no choice but to have a better educated population. Uh, Paul Wellstone said, we all do better when we all do better. I really like to say, we all do better when we all read better. Now, there's a town Lake Worth, Florida, where they have 30,000 people, one-third black, one-third white, one-third Hispanic, um, just north of Fort Lauderdale. And 97% of their children are at reduced or free hot lunches, which is a real key to, you know, uh, indicating poverty. So what they did is they made sure there was one little free library in safe walking distance of every child. So they put one little free library per 300 people, which is 100 little free library. The library stepped up, the school district stepped up, the mayor really stepped up, the police department, uh, the retailers, the fire department, the whole community said, our students are going to read. We are going to read. And they took it on as a community project to change everything. The Los Angeles Police Department has little free libraries in, in every precinct. I think one they don't, but... And they said boldly in the Los Angeles Times, little free libraries help prevent crime. And I thought, well, that's pretty bold. How can you say that? They said, well, 75% of the students that go before the, excuse me, 75% of the populace that goes before the juvenile court system is functionally illiterate. And we know it has a direct correlation to crime, to pregnancy, to you know, educate uh, graduation rates, job rates, and so on. So literacy is a real linchpin for the quality of, of the individual's life uh, outcomes and their and their healthcare. You know, because uh, they understand how to be a better patient. You know, because they understand and are able to critically think and read. So if we want to survive as a great nation, we really have no choice but to step it up in our game across the board and to make sure that everybody reads and reads well, because that's the only chance we have of comprehending and understanding all the complexities that this society is really bringing about. If I could disrupt that by having people pay attention to how important it is, that's fantastic. Yeah. One of the ways that you're disrupting is actually by empowering other people to disrupt, which I think is yeah. why it's, what you're doing is so powerful because if I 
get a, build a little free library and put it in front of my house and stock it with some books, I have disrupted my neighborhood in a very positive way. And, and then others see it and they do the same, but you're also not just making the books available, even for people who just drive by it or walk by it, there's a message that books are important, that reading is important. They can't avoid seeing that. And I think that's the sort of mind shift that happens. So what, what I really enjoy about what you set up here is that you're giving people a concrete way to disrupt in a very positive way in their own communities. I was at a literacy conference and I got tapped on the shoulder by our former governor in Wisconsin, uh, Governor Doyle, Jim Doyle. And he said, you know, Todd, uh, what's going on in America right now is, is not us. We're really not this divisive. We're really not this polarized. He said, Little Free Library is more of a reflection of who we are as Americans. He said, we, we reach across the aisle. We reach across the street. We pick each other up. We make each other's life better, not caring who somebody is or where they're from. We help them. He says, that's who we are as Americans. So I will contend with you that the disruption what's going on right now in, in, in America is not the true reflection of who we are. You know, what Little Free Library is and how we help each other, that is the reflection of who we really are. And I think, uh, if anything, we've got to shake ourselves to say, hey, let's get back to this. We can fix it. Um, we have a book, and it's called Little Free Library, and you can find that at Amazon or at our website, littlefreelibrary.org. And uh, the Los Angeles Times said our book was almost perfect social justice. Um, uh, the San Francisco paper said it's one of America's better exports, which I absolutely adore. How many countries and, right now are, are you in? Uh, about 85, you know, pushing 90. And uh, Amazon.com said Little Free Library was the best book since the 1970s Whole Earth Catalog <laughs> because it promised so much for hope for the future. And, you know, I, I think if you look at what we're doing, the stewards, the millions of people that use little free libraries, you'll see that we have a big community of people that care, that want to fix things, and that are really rolling up their sleeves to make a difference. And, and it's very contrary to what's being reported. I want to go back to the creation, that moment when it, when it sort of came together for you, particularly the few moments before that happened, because I think a lot of people listening would like to disrupt. They'd like to come up with an idea that changes the world or perhaps changes their community. And they have multiple things, but they can't quite get that cohesive idea. So talk about the moments before it came together and the things that were sort of in your head and then how it actually, how that light bulb went on for you with Little Free Library. I built the Little Free Library. I, I was laid off from the job at the time and I built it in honor of my mom. Um, uh, when my mom died at her funeral, I talked about two things. I talked about one, an old uh, tradition, colonial tradition, that uh, you give away a small gift and uh, at a funeral, gloves, hat, mittens, an old colonial tradition. And then the other thing was an old Sioux Indian saying that says nobody really ever passes until all, all they've touched are gone. And so I gave away a little necklace that said June Bowl, a dancing spirit, 1927 through. And then uh, in that spirit later, I put up a little free library that was a gift to the community of Bob. You know, it was a, her books and, and I, she was always giving to the community and to the neighbors and especially kids. And that was just a present to the community. And I never thought anything about it. And then we had a garage sale about a year later and people took pictures of the little free library, talked to it like it was a puppy, you know, pitched their voices high, took selfies. One woman hugged it. And I thought, huh? You know, this is pretty weird. I don't get this one. And so I heard a song or I heard a, a tale or I heard something uh, from the voice of the community about what this little free library was. So I made 30 more of them and I tried to uh, move them. And people were like, what is this? This makes no sense. The big bird feeder. It's crazy. And in one year, I think I moved one or two. And uh, winter was coming in 2010. And uh I heard a piece on Martin Luther King and he talked about how uh, if he was going to die tomorrow, he'd plant a seed. So I said, that's what I'll do. And so we gave away 30 little libraries and the strategy of strategically planning them. I just got back from New York city last week 
where we put a little free library in the subway. Actually, it was a Marvel library, a, a action hero Avengers library. And uh, it's in the subway at the police department. And uh, two years of books are going to be given away in that subway from uh, the Disney Corporation. So what happened is uh, Little Free Library became kind of this, this calling from the neighborhood. And for me, it was uh, really what you do is you create local heroes. Everybody that, you know, is the first in their community or their neighborhood becomes a hero. They put in a Little Free Library. They end up in the newspaper or the radio or TV. So you create like local heroes. And uh, there's, there's a story about Gandhi. Uh, he was being um, interviewed during a, a protest. And after about 15 minutes, um, Gandhi was uh, uh, asked the media, he said, excuse me, I have to go. I have to see where my followers are taking me. So what Gandhi was saying is he didn't lead the movement. You know? And I think the days of uh, uh, Martin Luther King's and Gandhi's are kind of quite limited because uh, they'll get eaten up and beaten up. And, and so what I think that we have is we have the strength of each other. One of the things that, that seems very interesting to me about how this movement happened and why it's so appealing, one of the many reasons it's so appealing, is that we live in a virtual world, but here is a physical object. Here is something that exists. You know, I think that people, you can only tweet so much. You can only do so many online petitions. You can only whatever, do so many podcasts. But what you've created here is the opportunity for people to actually put something physical into the world in the little free library and then also in the books themselves that makes an impact. In, in a lot of ways, this is a throwback. And I know that Andrew Carnegie was a, is, is a, uh, an inspiration of yours, but it's a throwback to that sort of mentality of putting something real out into the world. You know, I'm tactile. And many of the people that uh, have little free libraries are tactile. I hear all the time, book lovers say to me, I love books. Books are part of my heart and soul, and they define who I am. And a Little Free Library is just a natural extension of that. And in many ways of being a tactile person, what it also means is I don't feel loved unless I'm touched. And that touching is not only a physical hug or a kiss, but it is a, uh, a expression of I care. Uh, a woman came up to us at a 4th of July parade, and she was crying. And she looked and she said, I, do, I did not think that anybody loved us that much. You know, and that what, in many ways, it sounds corny, but Little Free Library is I care for you, I love for you, I love you right. in the community. Right. How, many, and, uh, how many Little Free Libraries are there now in the world? As of August 1st, uh, there will... Uh, <sighs> We're going to celebrate the first part of August where we're just hitting 75,000 little free libraries. And um, that, that at two books a day, which is quite conservative, is over 50 million books a year. And the New York library system is 27 million. <laughs> um, while that's impressive and I'm proud, um, the Lake Worth model of one little free library per 300 people we still have 1,025,000 little free libraries to go in the United States to get where we want to be. And we have, I think, 24.4 million worldwide to get there. And, and our, our goal at Little Free Library is that everybody has the right to read. And I want to see 90% of the world's population reading above the minimum reading standard. And the only way we could get there is if if it's like feminism or civil rights, it has to be a conscious effort by society that says, I'm going to make sure like Lake Worth that everybody reads in my community. And it's my job to make sure they do. And it's not to point and say it takes a village. It's to be a part of that. And so that's, that's the story of little free library really is everybody getting up and starting to say that it's like that old uh, network, you know, the movie, Mm -hmm. I'm mad as hell and I can't take it anymore. Mm -hmm. I think we as people have to say, we're just going to fix this. So and if people if people who are listening want to do that and want to get involved either by putting up their own little free library or lobbying their local community leaders to follow the Lake Worth model, what are some things they can do? What are some tools that you might have for them? I would say go to our little free library website at littlefreelibrary.org. 
And the first thing that everybody needs to do is go down to Flickr or Pinterest and look at the 40 or 50,000 photos from a around the world. The, the artwork, the, 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 the beauty, the, the communities coming together is just awe-inspiring. Just awe-inspiring. And then from there, go look at our website and look at some of the stories, look at the libraries of distinction, uh, see what people are doing around the world, get, re, get our newsletter. And there's so many things that you can do. I've, I've not found it yet where if a person wants a little free library or wants to have in their community that they don't get it. They could talk to their Rotary Club, their, they could talk to their schools, they could talk to their NEA. Matter of fact, we're just, we just signed a deal with NEA, Read Across America, and we're planning on trying to put a little free library in every school. And we have a mobile little library now that folds up and you put it in the back of police cars. And on the side of police cars, you can see it in our, in, in LA, and we're going to have it also in New York in the subways. But they have a magnetic sign that says, we share books. And the police are uh, handing books to kids on street corners and at ball games and at schools. And, you know, like I said, wherever we shall gather, there shall be books. And we want to see that with little free libraries and wagons and mobiles in your front yard. And, and just carry that through wherever we shall gather, there shall be books and somehow be in that equation. And um, it's, it's really rather easy. And it's really, you know, quite inspiring of the many ideas that people come up with. For instance, I know a gentleman in Arkansas who has a snub nose scissors at the end of his uh, little free library and he has books on, uh, on cooking and he has a, uh, all around his little library is a herb garden and he asks you to cut herbs and take them home and make things. And he's told me that he's had uh, quiches hot in the morning waiting for him, you know? And so uh, people do all kinds of fascinating things with little free libraries. They turn them into food shelves, tools. Uh, they exchange with their neighbors and they share assets, share assets. So, you know, there's a million things and a million things yet to be discovered. I see little free library is a new canvas, is a new way of expressing people to their communities. And, and it's really a commons that we all share. And we believe it's China's, it's ours, any neighbors. And so we're looking for, you know, more creativity, more wisdom. 65% uh, of the people make their own. And then 35% uh, purchase from our nonprofit to help support our nonprofit and move that forward. But they make their own and they just get a sign and a registration from us. That's $39 and that supports the organization. And if they can't afford that, uh, we continually have grants and availabilities for free signs um, when people apply. One thing I always like to ask people who are disruptors is, who is your favorite disruptor? Somebody from history, somebody who's alive today, but somebody you look at and said, that person really shook things up for the better. Ida B. Wells a small black woman that uh, when the conductor asked her to move out of the train car, she bit him. And uh, she started to end double ACP. She was, uh, uh, she was way ahead of her time. And she was, uh, I think five foot tall and about uh, 105 pounds. And so she ab absolutely changed the world, you know, and she was just spunky. And um, I, I really, uh, I admire that. But, you know, we talk about disruption and oftentimes we think uh, is of disruption is like the squeaky sound on the, the chalkboard as we scratch it, you know, um, which it is. But I often think that uh, uh, disruption is really uh, an act of kindness when least expected. And, uh, and it puts people off that you actually care. And a central theme that Little Free Library gets all the time is that they don't believe how much people really care. One final question. For those who are listening who want to disrupt, and I love what you just said about it being a, a kindness that when people don't expect it. When people want to do that, what is your best advice to them? Oh, well, I, I, I'm the executive director and creator of Little Free Library. Build a Little Free Library. Get a Little Free Library out there. Get a little mobile library and put it in a police department. Um, put it in a fire department, uh, put a little free library in front of a school, get a mobile library in a bus, 
you know, uh, I, I, um, I was speaking in Lake Worth to about a hundred eight, uh, eight year olds, and I asked them, how many of you are teachers? And nobody raised their hand. And then I asked them, how many of you read to your little brother and sister? And about two thirds of them raised their hand. And, and what happens is we're all really supposed to be teachers and they're all around us, the adults and the kids. And the more that we can make that a reality and more that we can make that happen, I think the better we'll be. And, and I think the other part, the other side of this coin with Little Free Library is we really need you to do that, you know? And, and, and as you know, when you're helping people, what you realize is that they're helping you even more because you need people to need you. And so that's kind of, I guess, my advice. Great. Well, disruptors listening, you have your marching orders. You know what to do and be creative. So, uh, Todd, I want to thank you, not just for spending this time with us, but also for putting something beautiful out into the world at a time when the world really needed it. And I, I wish you just tremendous success. We'll be supporting you. We'll be following you. We'll be putting up a little free library in front of our house. I intend to definitely do that and making sure there are more in my community. Uh, but what you've done is really a, a lovely and important thing and you're going to change the world. So thank you so much for that. Well, thank you. And I appreciate it so much. And uh, I would just like to add to that and say, for me, it's the better side of us. You know, it's, it's little free library is really made up of millions of people around the world that are fixing, changing and making the world better. And I truly believe that the great, globalization is literacy because 99.9% .9 of the world believes it's important and believes that it's something we need. And it's a great cry around the world to uh, help each other. So thank you. And thank you for having me on your program. Today's episode of Disruptor was brought to you by Writing Blueprints, the breakthrough step-by-step -step system for writers that creates truly great books. To learn more about the most disruptive way ever to become a successful author, visit writingblueprints.com and use the code DISRUPT to save 10% off everything on the site. The writing world has been shaken. Meet the earthquake. Go to writingblueprints.com and use the code DISRUPT to save 10%. Writing Blueprints. This is how you write a book. For show notes and videos, go to disruptcast.online. And to start a disruption of your own, visit writingblueprints.com to discover the most innovative and coolest way ever to write a great book. We'll be back next week. Until then, go forth and disrupt.